Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live Special 235, recorded January 8th, 2015. CES 2015, Tech West. This Twit Special is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to upgrade your IT skills or prepare for a certification? IT Pro TV offers engaging and informative tutorials streamed to your Roku, computer, or mobile device. For a free 7 day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash twit and use the code TWIT30. Printers, and scanners, and robots, oh my. It's the SANS Innovation Pavilion, and this is CES Day 4. One of the things that we've been geeking out to here at the SANS Innovation Pavilion have been the robots. And there is no bigger robot than the one behind me. This is the RoboScreen. Now imagine if there was an alternate reality. And imagine if you had that window into that alternate reality so you could see what was going on. Well, in a phrase, that's what the RoboScreen does. It merges a virtual world with the real world. As the robot pivots this screen, the sensors know which way it's pointing, and it will actually interact with the content on the screen. As it moves, it's as if this window is moving through that virtual world. Oh, it's been used by stage performers. It's been used for signage. But most of all, it's, it's just like an industrial application of VR, and I, I'm just geeking out to it. Now, you can go to ABB, check them out, look for the robo screen, and see if maybe this is the, uh, the next piece of art for your tech gallery. We've all seen 3D printing, but one of the missing elements has been making a 3D printer that works again and again and again. Well, that's a secret that the folks here at XYZ Printing have figured out. This printer right here, the DaVinci 1.0, is the hottest selling 3D printer on the planet. And you can currently buy this at Amazon, unlike a lot of other kits where you have to find some esoteric shop. Now, they've went from the DaVinci 1.0 to the DaVinci 2.0, which is a duo printer. It has two different heads, to this one, which is internet connected. So for those people who don't really want to have to design things, you can go through the internet to find the design you want to print. Now, if that's all that they had. XYZ would still be tops in my book, especially at that price point and at this quality. But they're increasing the state of the 3D printing arts by using this. This is the DaVinci 1.0 AIO, the all-in-one. This is a 3D scanner. That means that for those people who really don't want to have to design their own objects, you can put something into the scanning bed, it will take all the measurements, convert it into a standard format, and then you can 3D print it. Now here's the best part. You could use this 3D scanner to take an object that you want to improve, scan it, modify it. Like, let's say you wanted to add a handle or a mounting post and then print it up on a 3D printer. That's real innovation because it means I can take the objects from my daily life and make them that much better. Now, they're not just going to sit back on their laurels with a great 3D printer and a great 3D scanner. They've decided that they need something that everyone can afford, that everyone can use. They wanted to leverage the experience they have in being one of the biggest electronics manufacturing firms on the planet and give you a product that's durable, easy to use, and, well, cheap enough for you to buy. And that's what this is. This is the Da Vinci Junior. This is a $349 3D printer. Now, it's not just that it's inexpensive, it's that it's durable. It comes in its own case, so it's gonna keep everything nice and clean, and the head is removable. If you ever jam, if you ever have a, a feed problem, you can actually remove the head from the assembly without having to disassemble the entire printer. That's entirely different than some of the 3D printers that we played with in the past. It also comes with a one-year warranty. If you tried to buy a one-year warranty on some of the other 3D printer bots, well, it would actually cost more than the DaVinci itself. Now, this is not just a $349 printer. It's a statement from XYZ saying, everybody come. Start with the DaVinci Junior. Start with the $349 printer. See if your hand is good at designing 3D objects. Then add a laser scanner. And if your skill progresses, why not go up to one of the big boys? Now, if you want to start in 3D art, you got to give a try to XYZ. 
Now, 3D printing isn't all about utility. We know that. You've got to have the desire to create, the desire to build. And if you're a parent, you probably want your kids to have that desire. Well, XYZ is making it easier with this new series of robots. Now, imagine this. They sell you a kit that includes the servos and the controllers and the wiring and the chips that will allow you to create a robot. But then they give you the files to 3D print the frame, the structure, everything that turns the robot into a robot. This is a fantastic possibility for you to give your kids a love for learning. At 300 bucks per pop, it means that they're going to learn everything from microcontrollers to servos to how structures move and work to 3D printing. And in the end, they get a finished package that is their customized master of disaster. Robots. And you thought 3D printing was only about plastic? Shame on you. Here at XYZ, they've also got the 3D food printer. Yeah, no, you heard me right. Food printer. Now take the same technology that you would use in a, a 3D printer with a head, but instead of squirting ABS plastic, it's squirting edibles. Now they've got cartridges for dough, they've got cartridges for chocolate, and you can have the most intricate patterns being piled up one on top of the other to create cookies beyond compare, to create sweets that are sweet, and uh, just to geek out. Now, the, the thing that I really like about something like this is it's taking 3D printing into a space where we didn't think it was going to go. And isn't that what we want at CES? We want to be shown something that we haven't seen before. And if you're going to take a 3D printing technology that has grown over the last three, four years and give me something I can eat, well, I'm all for it. At XYZ, om nom 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 nom. You know, over the years, I've come to realize that I do tech pretty well, growing things not so much. To say I have a black thumb would be an understatement. I kill everything that grows. Of course, maybe that won't be the case now that we've got XYZ and their green cube. This device is a self-contained hydroponics farm. Now, the only thing you have to do is add water and power. It will give your plant the right light, the right humidity, the right temperature, and make sure that it stays watered so that you get a customized growing profile. Oh, I know that this is a niche product. This is going to be something that some people are going to say, well, why do I need a hydroponics farm in my house? But for $399, why wouldn't you? Go ahead and give it a try. See what you can grow, what kind of herbs, what kind of vegetables, and maybe you can find a difference in taste. Now, I know some people swear by organic, and this is uber organic. This is organic grown in your living room. Now, I wonder what else I could grow in the green cube. Uh, now, when I start off, uh, do I, I have to push myself forward a little bit before it goes? Um, not exactly. So the way I do it is that when I start, when I start with this, I just put plant this foot on the ground, I roll this out, and then followed by this one. So okay. it's like roll this out, makes your body move, and then followed by the other. Oh, okay, I get so roll it out. Roll it out. That's a very strange experience, I gotta say. Okay, let's just try this. And then so, push out. Like push so. out and roll with it. Roll with it. Roll with it. Come on, roll, go. Go, little skates. Don't let me die. Ah. Break. And now you're tall. There you go. Now, how did you, oh, how did you design these? Uh, bit by bit, it takes a year. What kind of motors are in it? Uh, it's motor in the wheel. Hot motor. It's hot motor in the wheel. Uh, how much power does it normally have? Like, so if let's say I was gonna do some continuous riding, how long would I go? Um, so we have three different models. It go ranges from six miles to all the way up to ten miles. Yeah. Ten miles. And of course, it depends how much weight you have. So I'm probably a little on the shorter side. Going uphill would take away some exactly. of your. Exactly. And also, if you ride very aggressively, it's gonna be. If you ride very aggressively, it's gonna take less mileage. That's, that's just the way it works. And if you ride very easy and nice and smooth, you're going to have longer battery. And what's the weight on these? Because they do have a little bit of heft because they're solid. So they are seven pound each. Uh, we are squeezing every bit we can to make it as light as possible, but there's a technical limit. But still, we will continue to push through, make it lighter and even more easy to use. And who do you see as the, the main market for this? So who's going to strap on a pack of rocket skates so definitely younger people the younger generation but there we see other people like doing it just 
take it on, it's take away. And I mean, everybody can have a chance. It just depends on whether they can like have fun inside it. Uh, right now, most people I see would take this as like a leisure, but um, it, it's totally okay to take it as a means of communication if that's like the right distance and 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 the right environment for you. Yeah. Thanks. Rocket skates. Do you even skate, bro? Virtual reality is one thing, but augmented reality is another. And here at Epson, they're trying to give you the best in augmented reality with the Move Aereo. I'm standing next to Mike, who's going to tell us a little bit about their new dev kit and what they're trying to do to bring the world of AR to you. Mike, what is this? Yeah. So what we have is the Maverio BT200. Essentially, this is an augmented reality glasses platform. We actually announced it last year at CES and launched it in April. So it's been on the market for about nine months. So here at CES 2015, we really want to show off everything that's happened in the developer kind of ecosystem and building out this whole group of software applications and, app and just various use cases for the product. So what it is, Pico projectors, it produces this very large virtual screen that floats in front of you and then accompanies uh, a bevy of sensors. So accelerometer, gyro, IMU, all this will enable you to do positional head tracking and also, of course, do a very other, a lot of other important things that we haven't even discovered yet. One of the things that I saw when I tested it was uh, it saw a QR code, and because it saw the QR code, it was able to scan it, and then it brought a menu up around the QR code that you could interact with. And I think that's that's one of those applications that's going to be a game changer. If you're walking down a street and it recognizes something that it should, and suddenly you've got options. Now, what kind of tech do you need to make that happen? Because there was no lag. It happened almost instantaneously. And as, as I moved my head, everything looked rock solid. It didn't look like an overlay, it looked like someone had painted it on the wall. So right now, I mean, in terms of doing it out in the wild, so to speak, so like you said, out in public, you just need a camera strong enough or a marker big enough to get the detection. So for things like QR codes, that's fairly easy to do. The harder thing is doing full-on object recognition or, for example, facial recognition, things like that. That's where you need a stronger camera. That's where you need more processing power. Right now, the glasses are a little big for the everyday consumer. It's much more of a developer platform. But we're also looking at all the enterprise, and that's where we're getting a lot of interest. Because even though this is about 88 grams, it's light enough for a technician to wear while they have their hard hat on and their safety helmet, and then they can do what you're also referring to. They can see real world objects, like an engine or uh, an airplane part, and then overlay instructions or content on top of it to help them do their job. That's, that's next level stuff. I mean, can you imagine if you're an IT person and you walk into a server room and because they're all QR coded, it'll automatically tell you this is what this server is, this is what this server is. Or like, you're, yeah, you're an aircraft technician, it sees an engine, it gives you an overlay of where everything should be. That's, that's the kind of tech that I want to see. But as you mentioned, you're going to need developers. So what are you doing to attract developers to this platform? So really building out the uh, entire developer program, and for Epson, this was a first. You know, most people associate Epson with printers or projectors, but they've long made a lot of sensors, and now they're just using the technology and building products that are developer-centered. So as a result, we're doing things like developer contests. Right here, we actually have a little brochure. I'll let you zoom in on that. It's $200 off uh, the glasses, and you have up to $10,000 in prizes for the top apps that people develop on the product. Also importantly, we like to bring people to CES. So everyone knows it's not completely cheap to come here and get a big booth. So we want to make it all about the developers, let them tell their stories to the press, let them tell their stories to everyone else. And for example, one of the companies over there launched their Kickstarter two days ago while they were here in the booth, giving them the exposure they need to have a big hardware manufacturer behind them with them providing the awesome and compelling use cases from the software side. Mike, in a second, I'm sure my cameraman is going to go around and show some of the uh, applications that have already been enabled for the Moverio, including my favorite, a DJI quadcopter. So if you've ever wanted to, to have the view of the quadcopter and yet have the picture from the camera, that's what they're doing here. This is, this is great. I, I want to see this on our shows. I want to see this in our programs. Mike, thank you so very much for talking to us. I, I'll promise you I'll do my level-headed best to get this onto our programming show, and maybe you will be the next person to develop for Moverio. We're still here at the Epson booth where they're showing off the, well, the best in augmented reality, but sometimes you need to get into real reality, specifically into the reality of information technology. And you know what? I know it's daunting. I know it's tough. I know it's difficult. I know there's a lot of information there that you may not have a complete grasp of, 
which is why we're happy to have IT Pro TV be a sponsor of this Twit special. Now, what is IT Pro TV? It's the easiest way, it's the best way to get information about Cisco, Juniper, pretty much anyone out there to find the information you need to get your basic understanding of how the world is connected. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, look, I'm already taking a certification course. I've already got a book that I'm reading. Well, IT Pro TV complements that. Their instructors allow you to get real world experience by listening to their real world experience. Now, if you watch a couple of hours of IT Pro TV, you're probably going to notice that it looks and sounds a lot like Twit. Well, that's not a mistake. You see, they're fans of the network, so what they've done is they've used the same TriCaster, the same cameras. In fact, they're using the same methodology of shooting because they're big fans of the network, which means it's going to be a seamless transition to go from the Twit Army to the IT Pro TV Army. Okay, now here's what we want you to do. We want you to get started right in 2015 by going to IT Pro TV and seeing if maybe a career in IT is for you. Right now, they've got a special for our audience. Go to IT Pro TV and, uh, well, you're gonna get a seven day free trial of all their courses. That means you can look at their coursework. You can look at their live stream. You can jump in the chat room. You can play with their sandbox, which will allow you to get your hands on millions of dollars worth of hardware from the comfort of your own home. Now, the subscriptions are normally $57 per month, but for uh, our viewers, they're gonna drop it down because they're fans of Twit TV. If you sign up now and use the code TWIT30, you'll receive 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. And once you reach your 13th month, they'll reduce your subscription rate even further to $24.95. That's $249 for the entire year. So, get into IT. Study it up. See if maybe this is where you are called. That's itpro.tv slash T-W-I-T, -T. and use the offer code TWIT30 to try it free for seven days and get 30% off. Laser scanners are nice if you want to scan something small, a, a thumb size object, but if you want a full body scan, something big, you could spend days and days and weeks and weeks profiling different photos, or you could spend 12 seconds in this 3D photo booth. This system is by Artec. It's an Artec 3D body scanning machine. Now, here's what it does. Taking the picture is only part of the process because anytime you take a scan, there's going to be missing information. There's going to be pieces that are there that shouldn't be there. Anyone who's done any sort of scanning, 2D scanning, 3D scanning, whatever, is going to know this phenomenon. Well, what Artec does is they've got proprietary software that actually looks for those missing pieces. It looks for the holes. It looks for the things that probably should be there. Uh, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds, but they've trained their software to know what the human body should look like. And so in this picture, you see I'm missing a couple of fingers. The back of my head is gone, although there are several people who say I don't have a head at all. My shoes don't look quite right. The software is gonna go through all of the different scans that it has composited together and say, no, there should be some flesh here. There should be some clothes here. He needs a head. That's the beauty of the Artec system, which is it understands what the picture should look like and then it interpolates to give you a complete 3D model. Now, this is something that nobody else is doing right now, and Artec is talking about expanding. They've already sold several of their systems to uh, overseas and, and into malls. So if you wanted, for example, an avatar for your gaming system, if, if you're a hardcore gamer and you wanted something that was special, you can now skin yourself into the game. And we're not talking about some weird, dithered version of yourself, but okay, uh, your let me, let me, actual okay, you body, your actual face, your actual skin into your game of choice. This is one of the parts of 3D printing slash 3D scanning that I think is going to be growing over the years. Now, the other thing that you can do with this model is you could buy your model from Artec and then you could bring it across the way here at the Sands Innovation Pavilion to a company that does professional full color 3D printing. Uh, there is a, a company here that will inject dye into the process so that they can get matching flesh tones. So if you've ever wanted to have a miniature figurine of yourself, well, you got to check out Artec 3D.
check this out. This is what the model looks like after it's done the first pass. So it's gone into grayscale and it's figured out all the missing pieces. Now, remember what it looked like in the full color. Now look at it, what it looks like in the grayscale. It has accurately figured out everything that needs to be added into the scan. This is one of the phenomenal things about Artech 3D. It's still doing its post-processing, but this is getting really close, so it's doing a couple of passes. Again, remember what this thing looked like when it first came out of the cooker, and now it's added in so much of that missing information. It's even got my smirk. That's right, my 3D model is smirking, folks. Everyone knows that the story at CES 2015 has been wearables. Everybody has a wearable, and it's getting more and more difficult in this crowded field to distinguish yourself. Well, they may have done that here at Misfit. I'm standing with Amy, who's going to tell us a little bit about the Shine. Amy, what is the Shine? So the Shine is an elegant activity tracker that you can wear anywhere on your body. Uh, there's three things that make it really different. Number one, it doesn't require any charging. So it runs off a battery that lasts six months. So it's really nice because you don't have to take it off to charge it every couple of days. Um, the other thing is that it's waterproof to 50 meters. So you can go swimming with it, you can do the dishes with it. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about it getting wet and it breaking. And then the other thing is that it's totally modular. So right here we have it in the sport band, but it also comes with a clip. There's some leather bands, a mesh metal bands that look kind of like a watch band. Uh, we have apparel that you can put in it as well. So it's really versatile and it looks a lot more like jewelry than a bulky piece of technology. Right, you're using Bluetooth uh, LE, so it's going to be low power requirements. You've got aircraft grade anodized aluminum, so it's going to be nice and durable. But I, I think that last part is what really sets it apart for me. Yes, it's nice to have the six month battery, but you've recognized that wearables doesn't mean on your wrist. There's going to be some people who want it on their ankle or on their belt or clipped onto the ear, whatever it's going to be. I think that's what separates the shine, but there is one more thing, and that is maybe people who want a wearable that has a bit more style, and you've got something for those folk. Yeah, we do. So um, on Monday, we launched the Swarovski Shine Collection, so I'm wearing that on my wrist right here. Um, as you can see, it, the entire front face of the Shine is a faceted crystal, so um, it's definitely um, more of a piece of jewelry, at least from the outside, than a piece of technology. And it does all the same things as Shine does. So if you double tap it, you can see the halo of lights that show your progress towards your daily activity goal, just like the, the regular Shine. But with Swarovski Shine, there's actually a line of nine accessories. So like you said, there's, um, there's pendants, there's necklaces. Um, it's really versatile, just like the original Shine as well. And all the accessories also work with the existing Shine. So um, that launch was exciting because all of our existing Shine users have op more options as well. Amy, thank you so very much for talking to us. I know that the wearables field is crowded, but uh, I think maybe you've got a little bit of shine. Undeniably, the wearables revolution started right here at Fitbit. And for 2015, they've got even more wearable goodness. I'm standing next to the same woman that I interviewed last year, Lindsay Cook. Lindsay, what's Fitbit got cooked up for us now? Got very, very lots, lots in store. Um, very excited. If you haven't heard about Fitbit, we're the leader in the connected health and fitness category, dedicated to helping people lead healthier, more active lives. We create a very wide range of fitness trackers that track things like your activity, your sleep, your weight, as well as what you eat. And all of this syncs wirelessly to mobile and online tools so you can see your progress and really stay motivated to reach those health and fitness goals. Uh, what we're really excited about at the show this year is we announced three products back in October, um, and two of them we announced are available now for broad release. So both Charge HR and Fitbit Surge. So I, I understand that one of the features that both of these products have is constant measuring of blood pulse pressure. What, 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 what metrics do you take? It's heart rate, which that, is really That exciting. thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> so it offers pure pulse heart rate technology, and heart rate is an incredibly exciting feature. It's been the number one requested um, feature from our users, and why? Because it tracks your heart rate all day and during workouts, helps give you some better calorie burn, helps you monitor workout intensity, and to do that without uncomfortable chest straps that many people are um, find very inconvenient. And it's also the, the, the fact that it can give us a continuous measurement means that you can have a, a more accurate picture of what your health is throughout the day. I know that a lot of products do that whole stop, take 20 seconds to take the heart rate, and then it takes a snapshot. This gives you a continuous movie of what your heart looks like throughout the day. 
Absolutely. So it measures it um, throughout your activity, um, your all-day activity, your workout specifically. A lot of people use heart rate to make sure that they're maintaining a certain intensity level. It measures it also while you're sleeping, so you can get things like resting heart rate, which is a really helpful measure in terms of cardiovascular fitness over time. So with the combination of all of these uh, information that goes to your Fitbit dashboard, you can see really what zones you're in. We make it really easy for folks with simplified heart rate zones. They can understand how heart health is just as important part of the, your overall activity. I have to ask this, and that is, you've kind of taken the wearable concept, the fitness concept, and taken it to its pinnacle. I mean, you are the uh, avowed leaders of wearable tech for fitness. Where do you go next? Now that you've got the constant heart rate monitor, what's what's left for 2016? Uh, there, there's a lot still in store. We're very excited about um, continuing to innovate. Our goal is really how do we build the best products and experiences that help you reach your health and fitness goals. So we're going to continue to do that with new products. Um, and you know, we, we don't comment about the timing of when they come to market, but I can tell you that we're truly dedicated to how do we bring the most advanced sensors and really reach the broadest audience. As you can see with our our new products, we're really going after some more active consumers. And so, no matter how you like to work out, um, we're going to deliver products that help uh, get you to reach those goals. Now, uh, pricing and availability on the new products? Yes, so um, Charge HR is going to come for $149.95, and it's available today, right now on Fitbit.com, as well as on major retailer websites. You'll find it in store towards the end of January, if you're interested in just going to pick up one in store, um, as well as for Fitbit Surge. Both of them um, are coming out this month. We're incredibly excited about it. Lindsay, thank you very much for talking to us. It's, it's always great to come back here every year and see what the fit people will actually be wearing. Again, that's Fitbit, the internet of things, the internet of exercise, I guess the internet of exercise things. So the internet of sweaty things. I'm Father Robert, let's go and see what else we've got here at the Sands. I played a lot, a lot of Ingress over the last couple of years. It's a game that Google put out. It's sort of a well, VR slash AR, but you have to play with your phone. You have to be scaring, staring at your screen, setting off bursters, setting up shields, capturing portals. It's fun. But wouldn't it be nice if you could put on a set of glasses and just see the world of ingress? Well, that's what they're trying to do here at Lightshot. I'm standing next to Tom, who kicked off a wonderful program with Kickstarter to create an alternate, oh, sorry, an, an, an augmented reality gaming environment. Tell me what this is. So what we have here is the Lightshot platform, which is an infrared transmitter and an infrared receiver that are paired using Bluetooth LE to your phone. So something very similar to, say, a laser tag. Except now you can do much more advanced gameplay. And what we're demonstrating here is a game called Assassin, which is based on the classic game that people have played on college campuses for a long time with Nerf guns. And it normally required a ref and somebody to keep track of all the rules. And in our case, it's all automated. So in this game, you would take a selfie. You're playing with three, four, five of your friends. You guys start up the game, and each of you is assigned another player that you're trying to hunt down and shoot with the lighter, the infrared uh, beam. And you're all wearing the light puck, which is the sensor. And so you have a limited amount of time in which you can complete your mission. If you complete the mission, you're assigned a new target, and the timer resets, and the game continues until there's only one player left. And this was just a simple example of the power of the things that you can do once you start connecting the Internet of Things to gaming. And we're very excited about all the various possibilities. This is just the first of many games that we're working on, and it's going to be an open platform. So other people can make games for our system, people can modify the hardware, and our Kickstarter started just a couple days ago, so you can now actually order the hardware, and we'll be shipping it in Q3 of this year. Now, one of the things that people need to, to realize about this is that you're not making a game. You, you've made a game, but you're really building a platform. You're building a framework that other devs can use to build up their fantasy environment. Uh, in fact, Google could come in and say, you know what, we're now going to enable ingress so that you see the portals in the glasses as you walk past them. That's what I love about this technology. Now, now tell me, what's the challenge of using something like the Muverio from Epson to create your AR game? What's the most difficult thing to do? 
I think the most difficult thing to do that people don't realize is when you're using something like on a monitor, you're displaying a full screen. And so you need to be very cognizant of the fact that people are looking through the glasses. And so there's a lot of things going on in the real world that they need to pay attention to. So you need to display a limited amount of information for the player, only what is necessary as opposed to trying to display everything to them. So in the case of Assassin, all we have is there's a compass dial at the bottom of the screen that's telling you the range uh, and direction that your opponent is in. There's a timer in the top right hand corner that's telling you how much time you have left to complete your mission. And when you eliminate your target, you'll be assigned a new target. You'll see that in the glasses as well. But we're trying to you know, minimize the information display. We're trying to copy it off something like a heads up display from a fighter jet so that you can run around, see what's going on in the real world while you're getting the data that's relevant to you in the glasses. I don't know how you did this, but my glasses are telling me that I have to shoot Karsten, which, kudos, very well done. Okay, now, let's get real. We know that you had a f phenomenal Kickstarter, but what needs to happen next? You need developers, you need talented people to come in and design things like wands so that people can fight in a, in a Harry Potter-esque type world. What do you want to see this do in 2016? What we really want to see is we want to get people playing mobile games in general, interacting with other people in the real world, and not sitting down staring at their phone. So if I can get people to play games and interact with the world around them in various ways, then I think that that's been a success for us, and that's really what we're trying to do here. My background has been in console development, where everything is always a secret. I can't talk about it with anybody. You've got to get approval. And with that, we were sort of rebelling against that with our product. So anybody can make any kind of game that they want for our system. They don't have to get permission from us. You can host your own game. You don't need to ever talk to us. Or if you want to host your game server on our platform, then you could pay us a small fee for hosting it, and you can run your own games. If you buy the hardware, we're going to give you the STL files for all the peripherals. There's an Arduino inside, so you can modify the hardware, make it do whatever you want. Now, big question, pricing, availability, availability, where do they go if they want to find out more about LightShot? So you can go to www.lightshot.com, L-Y-T-E-S-H-O-T dot com, and you can find out more about our product. That also has a link to our Kickstarter, which just went live a couple days ago. We've been working very hard for several years on this product. The hardware development has been done, and we're really trying to get people to just adopt the product, and we'll be shipping the hardware to people in Q3 this year. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you for showing off your, your, your wonderful dream for, for AR. And uh, until next time, remember, LightShot, Get in the game. One of the big storylines of CES 2015 has been the Internet of Things and home automation. Every manufacturer from Samsung to LG needs to give you a way that you can have your phone talk to your refrigerator, to your locks, to your doors, to your lights. Unfortunately, many of them have gone astray, at least at the beginning, by trying to come up with their own communications protocol when we geeks have known that there's been a perfect one for a long, long time. It's called Zigbee. I'm standing here at the Zigbee booth right next to the president and CEO of Zigbee, Mr. Tobin Richardson, who's going to explain why Zigbee is the communications protocol for the Internet of Things. Thank you so very much for talking to us. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk to you about the IoT. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of manufacturers went astray at the start because they tried to reinvent the wheel or they tried to use something like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in order to make their products work. Why is it that you don't think they started directly with Zigbee? I think a lot of company and manufacturers want to test out the market and see what's available. But in the end, when you want to have every device able to talk to any other device in a meaningful way, you really need to come back to an open global standard. And so we've been able to really learn a lot of the hard lessons along that way, along that path. And now we can bring that back here uh, with the Zigbee Alliance and our hundreds of companies and hundreds in the ecosystem, and now really uh, bring, to, bring to life the, the real smart home. Let's deep dive this just a tiny bit. What's the difference between Zigbee and Wi-Fi or Bluetooth? Because consumers know those products. They use them every day. They've maybe heard of Zigbee, but they may think it's a little bit of magic behind the scenes. What do you do that is so different, that is so power efficient, that is so good at connecting devices? Yeah, well, I think you've described it pretty well. We're low power, low data rate, uh, works really well with hundreds and thousands of devices versus other technologies that are really tailor fit for other purposes. So it's great to have Wi-Fi. And if I want to watch uh, House of Cards on Netflix, that's a great opportunity. If I want to check my heart rate while I'm running around, Bluetooth's great for that. But if I want to connect all these disparate devices by multiple manufacturers, whether it's 100 meters away or 50 meters away, in a really meaningful way, I've got to come up with something that's low power, low low uh, low data rate, takes advantage of things like mesh networking, so that the 
network is actually stronger instead of weaker when I add more devices. All these great things have uh, been developed by our manufacturers in the Zigbee Alliance. Our, our viewership is very tech savvy and uh, they have heard of Zigbee, but some of them think it's still a pipe dream and they don't realize that there are Zigbee products out right now. Can you, can you explain some of the products that are behind us right now? Yeah, absolutely. You've got a nice little uh, compendium here of uh, our uh, different kinds of products and it's really uh, uh, coming to fruition in terms of real products that are in the market today that are labeled that you can go out and look for Zigbee products. Uh, whether it's uh, coming into uh, lighting, every virtual, virtually every lighting manufacturer on the planet is standardized on Zigbee. So whether it's uh, Osram, GE, or Philips, it's going to be a Zigbee light bulb. Uh, you look at other applications uh, and I could go through many of those today. There are thousands of products now, which is a really exciting development. What you're looking at right now is this real senior lifestyle system. So if you're talking about uh, assisted living or living in place, uh, this really enables through all the applications of, of a smart home, uh, allowing folks that are in, in a senior uh, situation to be able to stay in their, in their home longer, allow caretakers or loved ones in the family to track things like whether or not they're able to, uh, they're able to get out of bed at, at the right time of the day, and if they aren't, I can get some early indicators that something's happening with my, with my folks and my grandparents and I can do something about that. That's just one application. There are so many different uh, applications for the IOT that we're seeing here at CES, and Zigbee's really helping to make all that possible. Give me your dream scenario. Coming into 2016, the next CES for next year, where would you like to see Zigbee positioned? Well, I think uh, we're already really quickly on the way to, uh, to getting there. Uh, Zigbee inside the home, we, our view of the smart home is that there's, a, there's a, a small number of global standards that allow manufacturers to really have a, a really cohesive approach to bringing the smart home uh, value to consumers. And we, we believe that's going to be Wi-Fi for, uh, for the media delivery. We believe it's going to be Bluetooth for some of those uh, wearables. Uh, and virtually everything else in the smart home is going to be Zigbee, and it will be Zigbee because it, it makes sense. And the consumer doesn't want to try and parse through 20 different standards and protocols, so it's great that some companies may think that they can try you know, one proprietary approach, but in the end, if you're really going to deliver that customer experience and the value to the end user, it has to be on a global open standard, and, and that's what we're all about. Tobin Richardson, the president and CEO of Zigbee, I want to thank you so very much for talking to us. Uh, if, if they wanted to find out more about the Zigbee Alliance, where do they go? Go to our great new website, zigbee.org, and you can find all sorts of white papers, uh, information about the manufacturers, and we've got a great product listing as well. We don't sell products, our manufacturers do, but you'll get a good idea for what's, uh, what's available there. Well, there you have it. Get real, get connected, get Zigbee. Now you knew that the SANS was going to be all about 3D printing, and of course we've got to give you one more. I'm here at New Matter taking a look at the Mod T, and I've got Steve Shell who's going to tell me why this might be the printer for you. Steve, what is this? The Mod T is a consumer-ready 3D printer. We're going to enter the market this year at below $400. We print in PLA at 100 micron layer thickness, competitive with a lot of much more expensive printers on the market today. It's also Wi-Fi connected, which connects it directly to the New Matter store, where you can find designs to print, and with one click, send them into the Mod T to print. Now, that, that is huge, because there are a lot of people who will get a 3D printer, but then they don't really know what to do with it. I mean, you have to come up with a design. It's, it's not just simply saying print. If this connects to a store, it means I could find something that looks interesting and then watch my printer go. That's right, and we've really tightly integrated the New Matter store to the Mod T, so every design in there is curated, tested to print on this hardware, so you know it's going to turn out right the first time, every time. I got to ask, Steve, why do you have the platform moving? I know there are a lot of printers that have the head moving back and forth, forward and back, left and right. You've gone a different approach. You've got the head raising and lowering, but the platform is what does the moving. Why go with that design? That's exactly right, and there's a couple of reasons we do that. So number one, it's a really interesting patent-pending mechanism that reduces the number of parts required to move that platform around. And reducing part count makes it less expensive to manufacture, also makes it more reliable. Also, very interestingly, is it completely negates the need to level the bed, because the bed is moving while the extruder is stationary. There's never a problem with bed leveling. That's actually huge. We had a 3D printer over at our studio, and the problem is we could never calibrate it properly, and so we kept getting gaps in our prints. If, if you're telling me that I could just go, that makes me happy. Okay, one other set of questions, and that's got to be about the specs. Tell me about the speed, tell me about the material, tell me about what are the things I need to know before I get printing. All right, so the Mod T is a consumer-ready 3D printer. We print PLA, all right, it's a very household-friendly material, doesn't give off nasty fumes or anything like that. Build envelope is six inches by four by five, large enough for your phone cases, a lot of the household objects. Layer resolution down to 100 microns, very competitive with a lot of other printers, and we print up to 80 millimeters per second. 
That's fantastic. Now, I sh I'm sure that eventually you're going to move to a two-head version so you can do multiple materials, but if they want to find, uh, find out about the Mod T, about what they can do with it and what they can do with your store, where should they go? Definitely go to newmatter.com. Steve Shell, I want to thank you for talking to us, thank and I, I want to thank you for showing off the Mod T. Fantastic piece of gear for under $400. Maybe, maybe this is how you're going to bring your dreams into reality. 3D printers are great in that it's a technology that allows you to create something out of what was previously just an idea. But most of them can print something like this. This is nice, it's a good size, it uses a bit of material, but sometimes you need something a bit bigger. And that's why I'm here with John Good from 3DP. John, this is about as large as 3D prints get, right? It's typical. That's correct, that's an, an average size. And uh, you've got something a bit bigger. Yes, something like 75 times bigger. Uh, are you going to show us what you got down here? Here's an example of a print off of the 3DP 1000, which is a one meter by one meter by a half meter work area. So people are printing entire objects to scale, furniture, engine blocks, uh, gas tanks. It's opening up all kinds of possibilities that just weren't available before and affordable. As you can see, this table in front of me, it's, it's not a table. Folks, this is actually the 3D printer. This entire surface is, well, you can put anything you want. If, if your mind can come up with something that can print into this area, you'll be able to turn it into reality. Uh, John, how big of an object can I create? Roughly three foot by three foot by almost two foot. And how quickly will that come together? I, I know one of the issues with some of the lower cost 3D printers is they'll take forever. I mean, it could take 24 hours to create something like this. Obviously, when you're dealing with something of that size, you're gonna need a bit more oomph. What does this do? The print time is a function of how dense the material or the object is. What I'm holding here in front of you would be roughly a 200 hour print. Now, the machine doesn't sleep. So uh, the good news is in about uh, seven days, you've got something that, in terms of alternative ways to produce it, we're even more uh, longer in duration. So it's a huge improvement. Where do you want this technology to go? Because obviously we could always print bigger, we could always print finer, we could always print faster, but uh, is there an end game? I mean, ultimately, do you want to create something from 3DP that will change what we do and what we think we can do with 3D printing? The answer is yes, uh, and it's being enabled by open. Uh, imagine being able to go ahead and leverage technologies in the form of materials uh, that you need chemists and material scientists to, to produce. I'll give you one example. Grab that red object right there. This is Ninja Flex. This is used to develop, this is used to develop tennis shoes. This is used to go ahead and, and solve flexibility problems that quite honestly, you know, people don't associate with plastics. Or imagine a polymer that has metal impregnated in it, or is conductive, or, or is made out of wood because you want it to look like a nice piece of finished uh, uh, art. That's fantastic. The last question has to be, how much is this going to set me back? I know, it's, I know it's a little costly, but when you consider what you get, I know uh, it's going to be justified. Let me describe what you're looking at in front of you is less than $20,000 US. Now, to compare that, a, a, a similar size machine would be starting at $200,000 and up. So this is a huge step forward by leveraging open for materials, for some of the electronics, to go ahead and make large format affordable. John Good, thank you so very much for sharing time with us. Could you tell our audience where they can find out more about 3DP and this wonderful printer? Gotta love the internet, www.3dpunlimited.com. 3DP Unlimited. Next time you need to print yourself a table, look no further. Well, it's been a long day here at uh, CES Day 4 at the Sands Innovation Pavilion. I've been walking on this treadmill for, oh, I don't know, about uh, 26 miles now. I want to thank Fitbit for sticking with me. That took me almost 30 minutes, so, you know, it's been a while. I haven't even broken a sweat. Now, there's plenty more coming. I mean, CES 2016 is actually just around the corner. We're going to have to start planning for it. But until then, remember all the gadgets, all the gizmos, the wearables, the self-driving cars, the home automation, the Internet of Things, the 3D printing, and all. That's right, we bring it to you because we love you. That's part of the experience of the Twin Army. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balancer, the Digital Jesuit, saying goodbye from CES 2015. Hey Carson, can I stop walking now?
<sighs> All right, let's go. Another 26 miles. 